We're here with Daniel Netheim. He's the director of The Hunter. Um, coming to North America right now. It must be exciting to be showing this film in the US. Um, it is actually. It's you know it's um, it's the holy grail of, uh, of film distribution, and um, so I'm really glad it's getting both a theatrical and a VOD um, release in the US. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm excited about the theatrical because the film is definitely a big, a big screen experience. You know, um, best seen on a, on, a, on a great wide screen um, with amazing sound. But uh, I'm also really happy that it, you know it's available for viewing right across the US um, on, on premium video on demand. So people who are fans, obviously, of Willem Dafoe and Sam Neill, Francis O'Connor. Um, Willem is in almost every scene of this film. Uh, let me know, like how, like how that first meeting, well, the first meeting you ever had with Willem, how you felt about meeting him, and why you wanted him so much for this role. Um, yeah, look, I met Willem. Um, I mean, the, the, the role was going to be very physically demanding. Um, there wasn't a lot of dialogue, you know. So I was really after an actor with a very expressive face, you know, with a, with a, a, a unique, you know, kind of physical quality. Um, Willem ticked both those boxes. Yeah. Plus, he was an actor whose work I'd always been been impressed by. Um, the diversity of his work, you know, the, 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 the quality of performances, and I guess his taste in choosing projects. You know, I kind of thought, I feel like we possibly like the same kind of movies. You know, um, but you know, you never know. Like, Willem may have loved the script, but he may have been committed for a year on on other projects. So yeah. it was kind of synchronicity that. Um, we got the script to him at a time where he had a window of availability. The script appealed to him. You know, there, there was something about the role that, uh, I guess, ticked the boxes of what he was looking for at a certain time. Yeah. Um, and uh, so we sent him the script. You know, I got a, we got a, a, a an ambiguous yet favourable response, enough to prompt me to fly to New York to meet him. Um, I met him right after I'd been into a screening of um, Antichrist, um, which I was not prepared for, you know. But it was once again, you know, it was fascinating to see um, uh, Willem in that context, you know, out in a little cabin in the woods. I met with him 20 minutes later and it was a good meeting. Did anything surprise you? Did anything about him, was that anything about him that was unexpected to you? That um, look, you know, there was, I didn't know the guy, so probably there were a lot of, lot of surprises. Um, one of the things I was really impressed by was, was his um, attention to detail with the props. You know, he really, as part of having full ownership of the character, it was important for him to have a very real sense of ownership about um, that character's possessions. You know, so um, for, you know, right down to the smallest knife. You know, he wanted to be presented with an array of choices. You know, to feel the way each one held in his hand, to look at the way, it, to see how it looked, to look at the age of it. You know, the provenance of it. Um, and so that was a pretty compelling attention to detail. Yeah. Um, you know, and look, certainly after the uh, the first kind of show and tell with the art department with some of the props that have been chosen for the character, um, some of that was definitely back to the drawing board. What about so he had an immediate impact on the film in, in that regard? Like, yeah, very well, very much so. But he, you know, I, I I'd offered him complete ownership of that character, and um, uh, so he embraced that. And, and yeah. part of that was having a level of comfort and familiarity, you know. I mean, this character, we only really learn about him through his actions, you know, the things he carries with, he, with him in his backpack to Tasmania. So he's on the hunt for this, um, a uh, uh, an animal that we've believed has been extinct since the late 1930s. This is the Tasmanian tiger, not to be confused with the Tasmanian devil that um, many people know about through the Warner Brothers cartoons. But yeah. the Tasmanian tiger was a real creature. You know, it, was, it, was, it looked like a large dog. It had stripes on its back. But it wasn't related to either a dog or a, or a cat. It was some. Um, it was a carnivorous marsupial, so it was more closely related to the kangaroo. Um, but early settlers in Tasmania feared that it was killing their sheep stocks. Um, the farmers hunted it down. The government put a bounty on its head. You know, they called it the wolf or the hyena. 
and it was really stigmatized. Um, and by the time there was any kind of environmental consciousness that that its numbers were threatened, you know, in the 1920s, it, it, the population had already fallen below a critical mass needed for survival. Yeah. The last the last known specimen died in a zoo in Hobart in 1936, and there's some very famous black and white footage of this poor forlorn creature pacing around this this cage, you know, very very unpleasant little cage. Uh, and you, we, we use that footage at the beginning of the film. I mean, you get to see this creature for real. Yeah. Is there any hope that it's still out there somewhere? Well, the creature, it's become mythologized in Australian culture. Um, it's like the, our Loch Ness Monster or the Yeti, you know. Although this one actually existed It actually at some existed, point. Yeah. But, but since it was officially declared extinct, um, there have been numerous reported sightings. Nearly every year, someone claims to see one in the wilderness. Um, National, particularly in Tasmania, a strong sense of belief uh, and hope that this myth is true. And I can see the attraction to that because, in a way, um, it lets us off the hook, you know, for the brutal destruction of the animal in the first place um, uh, and offers, a, offers us the chance for redemption. Yeah, absolutely. And in terms just for you personally, I mean, you're going to spend some time in LA. Um, showing the film in the US. What's next for you? Are you hoping to, to or are you thinking about moving across to the US and pursuing a project there? Or? Um, I would, I'd be very happy to come to shoot a project in the US and um, you know, to that end I've been reading a few scripts and uh, I've definitely seen some things that have interested me. Uh, so we'll see what happens. Well congratulations on the film and I uh, look forward to seeing uh, everything that's coming down the pipe. Yeah great, thanks. Cheers.